But uh, these journeys that we take in life, everything, even when you're opening a new company or you're starting a podcast or or um, taking the journeys that you and I are on, Yuma, you need to understand that you can't do that alone. And that is counterintuitive to our soul. It's counterintuitive to our male being. And those of us that did what we did for as long as we did it, it's counterintuitive to kind of the way we were raised. Not that the way we, I'm not talking military raised, but even the way I was raised on the dairy farm. You didn't have time to, to uh, um, really tell somebody how bad you were hurting. You had to milk the cows, right? right. And you so tough it out. And I, so the vulnerability thing is you have to be, to put yourself in a healthy place, you have to continuously be swimming upstream against what is natural. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. You guys all are very familiar with me at this point, Yuma Barnett here. And today I've got a, an Air Force vet. And like I say, when we have anybody that's not from the Ranger Regiment, we won't hold it against him. But it's uh, David David Nordell. And when I spoke with David a couple of weeks ago and we did our prep call, he we talked about something he brought up. He said two words that I've never said before in my life and definitely in my ne- military career, and that was maximum maximum fabulous. And I hope that David is maximum fabulous today. Um, and uh, we're going to get into that a little bit so you, get, you guys can all listen and can have a better understanding. But I want to toss it to David and let him introduce himself, and we'll get on with the conversation. Sure. Thanks, thanks Yuma. And you know what? We Air Force guys have had the privilege of, at least during my 30 years of uh, flying close air support and, and nobody nobody hates us for doing that that's so, right amen amen to all that we, we i think we get our part done pretty well and uh we have a lot of appreciation for snake eaters and guys that jump <laughs> on perfectly good airplanes yeah so it's all good yeah hey you know you i i'm um i'm just a, a dairy farm kid from northern california who grew up and always wanted to go in the military and i want to go in the navy and the day that I was at, at all the recruiters were at the high school, the Navy recruiter was not having a good day for some reason. And that all ended up in our Air Force, Air Force recruiter putting his arm around me. And then and, and, uh, off I went. Um, I went in to be a I went in to be a plumber. Oh, wow. And uh, the Air Force did my aptitude test and said, no, I don't think plumbing's your gig, man. I think you <laughs> probably need to uh, you probably need to be in medicine. And so they made me a straight leg medic, you know, and, and all that entails. And and you know, off I went to. Off I went to Spain to deliver babies for a year, and then I ended up in uh, after a year of that I ended up in the ER and doing shock trauma and the EMS stuff, and and um, you know we can get into some of these things, but that took me into independent duty medicine. Uh, the Navy guys understand that best because they have IDCs everywhere. Those are your fleet corpsmen and uh, the guys that are embedded with the Marines, and and then your Army side, you know, you have your 18 Delta um, um, Special Forces medics. Not a Special Forces snake eater guy, but on the medical side, I can hold my own with them. So. And uh, that took me a lot of places. And it actually, you know, I feel like I've, uh, I've, I should probably wear the 10th mountain patch because every crappy place that I ever ended up doing medical stuff, somebody from the 10th mountain said, we're short of medic. And I always ended up running around with them. And, you know, that even starts in 93 in, in Somalia and goes all the way through Iraq in 2008. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of me. And we'll talk a little bit about Max Fab and the flag behind me and how that got there. And, and I did have a I did have a Navy vet the other day tell me he goes, he goes, you retired as in his world, you know, a command master chief. You retired as a command chief, Air Force command chief, um, uh, in in your army world, you know, a battalion command sergeant major. And he goes, you retired at that level. And he goes, I don't think I ever ran into a guy like you that ever used the words maximum fabulous. Yeah, that's right. And so, right. So if I was running around yelling max fab uh, um with uh with your ranger bunch um everybody probably look at me like what is, you know they, i get a drug test right yeah, you're right so but we'll talk about that and why that is because max fab's what kept you guys alive when you're rolling across our tables uh coming off of medivacs yeah and um and it and it's a good thing so i'm glad to be here man yeah. god bless you. yeah i really appreciate you taking the time david and i will say you know i think the navy they they missed out the air force got a good one and to anybody out there listening if you're going to join the service of any kind a medical is the way to go because you're not getting cut from a manifest. Uh, some unit somewhere is always going to de- be need a medic. It doesn't matter if it says Air Force, Marines, Army, Navy, Coast Guard. Uh, above the uh, on your uniform, if they need you need a medic. You need medical personnel on the ground. You need medic and you need fire. So those guys never got cut from a manifest all the time. I was in the 75th. Uh, so it's it's a good it's a good place to start. Um, we'll get it started off. I'll, I'll ask the question I ask everybody about uh, a vulnerability and, and what's your definition of vulnerability? 
Sure. So, you know, we've, um, we've over to, you know, we hardcore military guys, we hate it when it gets an acronym and it gets a, gets a regulation or a policy <laughs> attached to it. Right. Because if we're doing things right, um, we open levels of vulnerability at all different stages. And I think vulnerability really starts with the relationship and then it starts with your inner courage and, and how you're, and how you're talking to yourself. You know, you, we get to coach ourselves up every day and we can tell ourselves a whole bunch of bad stuff and believe that. And we can also coach ourselves up every day and, and have the courage to understand that, that uh, these journeys that we take in life, we're going to talk a lot about PTSD today, obviously, but, but uh, these journeys that we take in life, everything, even when you're opening a new company or you're starting a podcast or, or um, taking the journeys that you and I are on, Yuma, you need to understand that you can't do that alone. Right. And that is counterintuitive to our soul. It's counterintuitive to our male being. And those of us that did what we did for as long as we did it. It's counterintuitive to kind of the way we were raised. Not that the way we, and I'm talking military raised, but even the way I was raised on the dairy farm, you didn't have time to, to uh, um, really tell somebody how bad you were hurting. You had to milk the cows, right? right. And you so tough it out. And I, so the vulnerability thing is you have to be, to put yourself in a healthy place, you have to continuously be swimming upstream against what is natural. And, and, and that comes natural. Some of those things are okay. But when we're talking about the things that, uh, especially what we're here to talk about, our mental health, um, where we're at in our, in our journeys coming, you know, out of the, out of the military. And it, this is that, this is that moral injury. And this is the, you know, the things we can't unsee, unhear, and unsmell. All of those things, all of that, all that, even just the separation and the, and the loss of, of camaraderie and those type of things, all of that stuff is difficult. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you a little bit of, you know, if you got a second, I'll tell you a quick story. My EOD guys, when I was at Hill Air Force Base in, uh, in Utah, got the snot kicked out of them. We lost three guys. In fact, there was a married couple there and the wife of the married couple, and she was, she was, um, killed in Iraq. And they asked me, in fact, I, one of the guys, I just talked to one of the guys this week on the phone. We still stay in touch. They asked me to come to this really obtuse, um, thing that they did um to mourn when they lost somebody and they would all lock themselves in this room and they would put videotapes up of this person and off duty and on duty and their families and training events and you know downrange stuff and it was just kind of like this memorialized thing and in the room people are crying and people are mad and people are you know doing testimonials and they go through all this so it's a big deal it was a big deal to be invited but being an independent duty medic Again, you're embedded in all of this stuff, and and so I had some cred with them, and and they let me a couple layers inside their inside their world. And at the end, they looked at the back in the back of the room, and they said, "Chief," he said, "How do you think we're doing?" And I said, "You guys are doing terrible." I said, "You're doing self care." I said, "You're adding ten pounds to your ruck. You're climbing a, an extra ten degrees on the hill. You're breaking your physical body because you're trying to take care of your mental body, and you're not." It's the scales thing, right? And when you have these events, it knocks your scales off. And then you get to choose what you put on this side to balance it. And a lot of times the first three things we pick are Jim and Jan, Johnny and Jack. So that those are you know, those are those are terrible people to be vulnerable with. Um, yeah. and the bartender, right? So yeah. So it's really just it's really just swimming against uh kind of what we know to get to a healthy place. And it takes courage to do that. Probably more courage than even than even getting out of the back of the the you know, the MRAP and, 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 and deploying out. I mean, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of courage and we've got it. So yeah. you're right. It, uh, it does take a lot more courage than it. I would, I would definitely do a 30,000 foot jump or run off the back of a CH 47 before, uh, you know, talking about PTSD and mental health, uh, you know, five years ago before I start, you know, kind of found a new path and a new journey, but you so, said it in there, the, the way we were raised and, uh, you and I both have similar, you know, kind of where we, I grew up on a ranch, you know, cows were life. Uh, you grew up on a dairy farm. I, I have family that runs a dairy farm in New Mexico. And I know that that is a 24, seven, 367 days a year type thing, you know, <laughs> it never ends. So uh, I just like to hear, for, you know, I don't get a lot of farmers and ranchers that have been on the podcast. So I, it's always me talking about it. I'd love to hear some other perspective of how that growing up on a dairy farm prepared you for life and your, your time in the military. Right. So, you know, I put a lot of it, I put a lot of it in a book, but, uh, um, the, the, so I don't think that there's anything, if you're paying attention now, obviously you and I were young, right? So 
So you're, you're learning lessons at five and they, they may not even flash into your head until you're 35. Or you may not draw the corollaries. Uh, when you're in a farm environment, especially when you're really dependent on animals like cows, uh, when you're in a farm environment, everything is there. Everything, every, think about all the twists and turns you've taken in your life up to now. Relationships, life, death, loss, success, triumph, uh, the results of hard work, mother nature intervening at a level that uh, yes. destroys everything that, uh, that, that, that you know. Thinking that you're done and turning your turning around a corner and seeing a fence land down and you have no idea how it got that way. Uh, priorities. Um, uh, what's you know um, balance. Uh, you know uh, patience. Change management. You know I write a whole write a whole chapter on the, the crying calves when we were weaning calves all the time and staying up all summer because they cried all night and you know and 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 do you take the shortcut and give them milk and hush them up or do you just you know, deal with the pain of change. And then, and then all of a sudden it's, it's natural again. All of those things are there. And so it's relative, right? Yeah. And I, I have a, I have a CEO that I'm mentoring and she was having a rough day the other day. And I said, was anybody shooting at you? She knows kind of my background. Right. And I said, was anybody shooting at you? And she goes, of course not. And I said, then how bad was it? And she'll write me, she writes me notes now. And she goes, you know what? I'm having a really rough time right now, but nobody's shooting at me. So it can't <laughs> be that bad. And so, and so on the farm, it 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 balances when you go out and get raised on the farm. It really balances in life. And and so you've been around and 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 you've been to some some rough spots. You know, I tell everybody if you get an opportunity, everybody should go to East Africa and then come back home. Right. Because because home problems don't seem like they are. So in the bigger context, when you want to talk about the farm stuff, you can relate it all back to a two man job that has to be done by yourself and your creativity and your ingenuity and your ability to, 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 to do those things. Well, that all applies to what we're talking about today, right? Because um, you got to bring things to bear that shape you and, and all of your, all of your resources, especially when you're dealing with this mental health piece and, and actually saying it out loud, you know, yeah. you know, my name's Juma or my name's Dave and, and, and here's where I'm at. And um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah, like, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I you brought back some memories about weaning calves and stuff. I hadn't even thought about that stuff in years, but uh, yeah, you're so right there. And so eventually, you, you left the farm and, and went to the Air Force. So, what was it that made you feel the call to service to the Air Force? Was it a family background thing or something you wanted to do? Was it a way off of the dairy farm? Uh, what was it? Uh, I I made a joke of my with my in your world the di my ti. He was a he was a he was a I crossed over a Marine, crazy guy, Vietnam vet. And he started in on me about being a farm kid in basic training. And I said, Hey, I just came here so I could sleep in in the morning. That's right. <laughs> he thought that he thought that was he thought that was pretty funny. Uh Yuma, I used to get up, I used to set my alarm as a young kid to get up at two o'clock in the morning and watch old black and whites of John Wayne storming the beaches of Iwo Jima. And I want to be the guy on the on the destroyer with those guns prepping the beach and that kind of I was totally I was into that. And I think a lot of that was I had a my grandmother's brother um actually and I have all of his letters from when he when he left uh to go to basic training uh during World War II. And he was a combat engineer and he went to Fort Leonard Wood. But his letters are talking about building Fort Leonard Wood. So he's in basic training while they're actually building Fort Leonard Wood oh, wow. on, the, on the flight. Or actually, you know, you know um, uh, building brand new barracks and all that stuff that's going up. And, it, and it's pretty interesting. And, and he always kind of took a shine to me when I was a kid. And, uh, and I, I respected him and I knew what his background was. And so, you know, there was a drive there to, I mean, if there's a role model, there's a drive there to kind of be like him. And so... Uh, so all you set all of that in and and I really had my heart set on the Navy and you know all in all in a, a really five minute time frame it all changed the air force yeah yeah I can I can relate completely uh, I remember some of my the first movies I ever had back in the day they were on a VHS cassette you know recorded off of TBS because we didn't have you know satellite TV out on the ranch and it right. was uh it was Green Berets with John Wayne and and Kelly's Heroes with uh, Clint Eastwood. And I must have watched those two movies a thousand times. And that was kind of what started my curiosity into the military. So um, uh, I, I just I can relate so so much with that and and seeing what those guys did in the, in the theater in the movies back then. It made me just it fired me up and made me want to want to go serve. Um, this is a 
we could talk for two hours, I think, about this next kind of question, but sure. uh, I just kind of want your perspective on it. Coming from the farm uh, and what you did in the in the Air Force, what did you learn about people and leading people in your time in the Air Force? Because, you know, as you know, the military, it's very diverse. We have people from the farm. You have people from the concrete jungle. You got people from, you know, uh, some mm-hmm. people from third world countries that came over here and are trying to find a way in the, in the U.S. and service was that way. So what did you learn about leading people in the Air Force? You're, this is a baited question, right? You must have thumbed through my butt. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is so um, I'm going to tell you the story. I'm going to tell you the story right when I started. The amazing thing about the United States military, and I think the best thing, the, the thing that the military gives us that we get to keep forever is, is they start developing you as a leader the day you walk in. You don't realize it, right? You don't realize it. Now, when my TI tapped me out in basic training and said, you're a squad leader, here's your 12 guys. Um, that's a little ominous, right? You got to figure that out. And one thing, Yuma, when you grow up on a farm, uh, you don't live in very diverse communities. It just kind of is yeah, what it is. Farming right. communities are not diverse. And so, and I'll tie all this back to leadership. And I guess I'll front load it. I'll do bottom line up front here. Bottom line up front is, is that leadership is not a book that you pick up that has the five ways, the seven hows, and the 12 habits. It's not, that's not a book. That's not, it's not a book. You can't, there's no checklist of leadership and there's no, no, no algorithm. Leadership is, is working on yourself, right? And, and how you, and, and how you go about shaping yourself to fit your environment so that you can be the best leader that you can be for your people. Cause it is, it is about servitude. That's cliche. I know because everybody's written about it and said it a thousand times, but it is about servitude. So you have to teach yourself to be a servant. Well, what more of a servant is anybody that gets up twice, to, twice a day to go out to put you in a barn and milk you and make sure you're comfortable and you're serving animals the whole time. Right. And then the, 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 the next service on top of that is you're serving your families and those things. So I get to San Antonio, Texas in, uh, on November 30th of 1984. And by, the 5th of December, I'm a squad leader and I've got 12 guys in my squad and you just said it, they're, they're coming from everywhere. But a large chunk of our flight was from inner city, Philadelphia and upstate New York. I don't know. That's, that's how it worked. Yuma, I had one black guy I grew up with in my entire community and his name was George Washington Jefferson. He has since changed it. He was actually in my class. And so uh, through the ignorance of the way I was raised, the jokes around the table and the vernacular, the things that came out of our mouths were uh, not complimentary. In fact, they're not even socially accepted, but they were just natural for us. And it's just out of sheer ignorance. It's not out of a bad heart. And it's not out of hate. It's out of sheer ignorance. And so I used the, I used the N-word while I was actually trying to get something done with a guy that uh, was from inner city, Philadelphia. Didn't think anything of it. Had the blessing of two prior army guys that were there doing their three weeks, learning how to wear the Air Force uniform, pulled me aside and had a conversation with me about um, their perspective on things, what that word meant. And and they cared enough about me at that particular moment to say, hey, here's your opportunity. So what I learned from that moment on and what I've done for the rest of my entire life is trying to close. And I speak about this when I when I talk to larger groups is closing that that 25 yards. And the 25 yards is about the length of a, of a barracks, if you think about it. Yep. From, 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 the, from the one bunk to the end bunk is about 25 yards. And this, this story is kind of around that. And so at 25 yards, Yuma, we're pretty comfortable. In a room, 25 yards from anybody, you're pretty comfortable. And you can make a lot of assumptions, right? It's no different. It's no different than being dismounted or at a checkpoint. At 25 yards, you start to make decisions, don't you? Yeah. Based on your training and based on how whatever's in front of you looks. And and that's uh and that's part of why we have the stresses that we have. Most of the time, our initial assumptions at 25 yards are pretty wrong. And the example that I like to use is I could I could look at 25 yards and see somebody that's grossly overweight and make the assumption that they're lazy, they don't have a job, they have poor socioeconomic status, they don't know how to eat, they're just you know slovenly. But if I talk to that person, they may have been a bodybuilder a year ago or a, or a newspaper, you know, magazine model, um, but they've got cancer and they're all screwed up. Right. So the leadership piece is about learning what you're leading and learning who you are as a leader. Um, boomers need to lead millennials motivationally 
to things that millennials will attach to, not my stuff. Right. If you don't look like me, I had a, I had a, this is, this is probably pretty appropriate. I had a psychologist that came to talk to us. I was an E7 at the time. And uh, she came to talk to us. She came to talk to the senior NCOs about um, the mental health of who we were leading. And she said, the biggest um, problem, the biggest barrier that we have in the military is we all dress the same. And she goes, so you make assumptions that you're new airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coasties, spacemen. You make assumptions that uh, they're like you because they dress like you and they have the same standards as you. However, rental car companies won't let you rent a car until you're 25 because you don't have full brain development. Right? So in leadership, we have to be in tune with that stuff, which means we have to work on ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot there. Um, but my, my whole, you know, farming philosophy to leadership philosophy, it's still around servitude. I mean, if, if you, you know, when the new NCOs would they, they get their, you know, now you're going to get your troops, right? You're going to get your, your guys and gals. I used to always tell them, um, just to remember that, uh, they're going to have some conversations every day with those people. And to them, it could be four or five conversations or a hundred, but they're the most important conversations to those people every day. And you need to listen to what they're telling you. Yeah. So it's, it's all about not being you. It's about being for them. Yeah. I think you're right. You say something there that ra- that reminded me of something in my own leadership. You know, as we grow in the military, we start be- to become socially disconnected from those that we lead. Uh, they They do things are different. Social media changed everything, and I was getting frustrated with the fact that they they were not coming to me to be led. But then I said, then I finally said, I, "That's not leadership. I have to go to them and then lead them to where I need them to be or where they need to be." And it changed my whole perspective on leadership and how I was as a leader and how I interacted with, uh, you know, junior officers, junior and junior enlisted, junior NCOs, it changed, uh, changed my perspective because I was, I wanted them to come to me because I, I knew everything. You are supposed to come ask me where in reality, yeah, that's not leadership. You, you, you go to them and you lead them to where you need to be like a good basketball, like a good college basketball coach or a football coach. They, you know, you got to go down there and get them. So, uh, I, I can, I just, just something that came in my head as, as you were talking there, um, on the next part here. I mean, you were in the medical field, so you you had a lot of challenging days, mm-hmm. right? You saw a lot of you you saw a lot of things where people were at their worst mm-hmm. or at their end. Um, uh, probably had a lot of times when you wanted to do more for somebody that was on a table, and you just right. knew you couldn't. It was over. Uh, uh, so this is going to be, you know, it's kind of it's a tough it's a tough question because, like I said, you could probably talk for hours on it, but I just wonder what is that most challenging day that you had in uniform that still kind of sticks with you? Well, it's in the book. Um, I'm going to give you one. I'll tell you there's, there's in 08 during the surge was probably the roughest. There's some times in Somalia that were tough. Um, you know, Yuma, this is a leadership thing. This is a uh, 25 feet, 25 yard thing, because this all probably started at 25 yards. Uh, and it's a um, it's uh, staying in tune, going to them to lead them. 12 percent of all the casualties that we got there at, at Blood were kids. And so the innocence that's taken out of a lot of people during wartime is is crazy. And that weighs on you. And you always want to save them. And, and I was always, you know, because I'm shock trauma there. So I was working. So I was that weird E9 guy. And people go, Chief, what are you doing? And I'd say, oh, that's what I do for a living. And I'm, you know, I'm, my, got my stuff on and, and, and we're, we're in it, you know, and it, not, not any, you know, my predecessors and everybody they did, you know, and the, the people that came after me did things differently based on who they were and what they were. But, but uh, I had the advantage of being able to be in there with them and that helped. We had a, a, uh, uh, time I think there were three times we had major um, V bids or 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 um, or uh, um, suicide bombing type things go on locally where we got everything from it all our guys their guys the whole everything and uh, we had a bunch of kids one time they're all rolling in and I'm standing back 
my guy, the guys were great. I, the, my people were the most wonderful people on the face of the planet. They're well trained and they're just lifesavers and it's great. And I'd come down and doing, you know, I'm doing the macro thing as a good chief should, right? You're taking in the whole thing and seeing what needs holes need to be plugged. And the beds are all full and everybody's working. And this one kid came in and he was really right on the edge of is he going to make it or not? And I already knew who I could tell by. resources and and i'm looking and everything's disproportionate soldiers aren't getting what they need other you know other victims aren't getting what they need and i went over the dock is face down he's working on kids airway and everybody's around this kid and resources or even more resources and i stood behind him off his right shoulder and i just leaned forward and i said i said doc i said i need you to step back for a second and take a look at the room i said because we've got an inordinate amount of resources based on on what's going on. And I said, we're going to have to peel some of this off. And I said, and I think you know that you know, we're, we might be wasting our time here. And he stood back and he looked around the room a little bit and he, he leaned, he stood up and he said, he said, you know, I think we need to peel everybody off of here. He goes, and, you know, and in emergency medicine, even in combat, it, it's a vote, right? Everybody says, do we keep going or do we stop? And then if one person says we need to keep going, you keep going. And it's just, I think so part of that's there for your emotional stability. And part of that's there because you have to rely on everybody's experience. And if somebody's seen something before where it might be, then we you play it out. And to his credit, and maybe because I, was, I had his six, um, everybody kind of said, yeah, that's okay. And Yuma, at that moment, we went from all of these resources and this attention everything disappeared. The one person left to, to attend to the post-mortem type stuff. And, uh, you know, when you sit back and then reflect on that, um, you know, my words, my position, my authority, my words, um, changed all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you wish you could have done more and, you know, hopefully what I did helped other people to, you know, have better outcomes, but, yeah, that stuff is not, it's not, uh, it's not, well, it'll never go away. It's not taken lightly. Yeah. There's, there's a few other similar ones. I will tell you that we had, we had uh, in that same, in that same deployment, we had three soldiers commit suicide on the same day in the same way, almost in the same place. And none of them knew each other. That was a rough day for me too, because there was a lot of, I couldn't, figure it out. I mean, I got a little bit of information. We can talk a little bit about that, but I got a little bit of information about each of them and all of them were off the fob, outside the wire, seasoned guys, two or three deployments into this. And it was the little thing that put them over the edge. Girlfriend's letter, something their mom said, yeah. something that happened, it, stuff that it was, had nothing to do with the next, you know, the next go. And, um, and uh, there's a lot to be there's a lot to be learned there about yeah. uh, about the actual. So yeah, yeah. It's not, I mean, obviously some some tough times, um, but it's not all doom and gloom in the military. There's some great uh -huh. some of my best you know my best times in my life. You know, other you know take away my kids being born and stuff like that. Or when I was in uniform and with the boys and the girls and and, and doing things. So to to bring it back a little bit, what was your best day in uniform or something that you just look back on? So I'm the command chief at Fairchild Air Force Base, uh, just outside of Spokane, Washington. It's my first command belt, right? So it's a it's a tanker wing, refueling wing. And my phone rings one day. I, well, first I got an email that said, I need to talk to you. Can will you call me? And it was a first sergeant that was down in New Mexico. And uh and he called me and he said, he said, Chief, I need your help. He goes, I have to get to Fairchild. I get so I did. And I said, well, what's going on? He says, he said, my son has got this rare medical condition and he, uh, there's, there's two pediatricians in the United States of America that can handle this medical condition. And one of them is in Spokane. And I said, well, what have you done? Cause there's process for that. Right. Yeah. And I said, what have you done? And he goes, I did this and this and this. And he had done the pro he's a first sergeant. He knew. He'd done the process perfectly. And I said, and, and he goes, the Air Force, big Air Force, big Army, bigger. The Air Force isn't going to make it happen. They, they just, the manpower people, the personnel people don't see a way to make it happen. 
So I went up the phone, Yuma, and then I went into full E9 mode and I started <laughs> working. <laughs> and within a couple of weeks, uh, we had worked uh, an appropriate but uh, and a complicated way to get him up there. And in a couple of weeks, we had him up there uh, with his family. Uh, he went and saw his doctor. It was probably pretty close to the, to the beginning of my tour. So you roll the clock forward 18 months later and uh and we're having it going away and everybody's you know everybody's coming to the chiefs going away you've been to all you've been to a thousand of them. and uh he brought his kid and he brought his kid up to me and he stood there and he said chief he said you saved his life oh, wow. and he's only here because of what you did wow so if you really want to throw your rank around and be all proud of who you yeah. are that's the way to do it. Yeah. I think we, you know, anybody's in senior leadership, hopefully everybody has a lot of times we get bogged down with doctrine or policy and standards and discipline. And we have to use the, that E8, E9 rank for stuff like that. When you can actually use your rank for some good, you know, that makes you warm and fuzzy on the inside that what, that's what makes it all worthwhile. And, and I can relate to that on, on a few occasions. So you did 30 years in the air yeah. force. Uh, um, so, the transition, some would think you did 30 years, your transition back to civilian life would be easy, right? And uh, uh, we all know that that's not true. Um, but it, there's a lot of people right now, the military as a whole is in a big transition, right? Mm -hmm. Afghanistan's still freshly over. Right. GWAT's freshly over. A lot of people hanging up their uniform mid-career. A lot of people saying, okay, it's time to finally punch out at 20, you know, 20 years or to 30-year time frame mm -hmm. right about now. Mm -hmm. Uh, what advice do you have for those people about, you know, as they enter that transition mode? Take a deep breath. It's almost like going to basic training all over again. It's absolutely almost going like the, the anxiety and the unsurety and the big wide eyed stuff. And every day that you are walking around out into the new world is different. And you're taking it all in and that can be stressful and it can be enriching and it can be a lot of things. Um, I should have wrote a book that said the 15 things you didn't know about the United States Air Force until you retire. Hmm. I think you get I think you get a career rucksack the day that you enter the service and people start putting little pieces of straw in your rucksack. And so after 20 years or 25 years or 26, 27, 30 years, there's a lot of stuff in that rucksack, but you've been hauling around so long that it just, it's just there. And then as a friend of mine put the other day, she goes, yeah. And she goes, and then one day you go to, you go to, you know, supply and you turn in your ruck and your flak vest and your helmet and you turn in all of that stuff and you do an about face and you walk around and there's all your identity is gone and you out the door you go. And there you are. And that rucksack comes off. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, you love it. You love the stopping the cream and stop, you know, shaving. I mean, all the things that you just have to do daily. Those are those are all pieces of, of lint and 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 straws that go in that. Right. But when that comes off, it's not natural. I mean, you almost float. Right. And that physiologically does stuff to you. Mentally, it does stuff to you and it throws your equilibrium off. Doesn't matter how much of a relief it is, it just throw in all of those areas, it just throws your equilibrium off. And then you go out into the world. I'm gonna get ready. I'm going to speak at the end of February in a column. And one of the things I have written on the slide is um those civilian people. <laughs> and because and and bless their heart, they are not bad. They're not good. They are people and they're doing what they know. They're they're doing what they know. They have they have their own farm stories or they have their own stuff that, that shapes them. But the military requires you to have a gear. They give it to you to have a gear. And that gear is the gear that gets you from the threat to neutralizing the threat. You have to have that gear. Well, guess what? If you work at Kohl's, you don't have to have that gear. That's right. Except we all walk in with that gear. <laughs> so somebody says, I'm just using a department store. I, I managed Subway sandwich shops for a year. I thought that would be a piece of cake. It's a bunch of young people. I know how to lead them. It's all, it's all right now. Hard. <laughs> really hard. Because they don't have the gear. <laughs> and so you go into a department store and, and you're working that first day. And somebody says, hey, we got to put up these three racks. It needs to look like this. And you go, oh, that's easy stuff. And you're you're humping it, right? 
you're like, I don't need my 15 minute break. Let's get this done. Like, what's the next thing? And everybody else is pissed. Not, not think you're weird. They are pissed. And it goes from everything. You're making me look bad. What's your issue? We have all day to do this. And you, and in your mind, you say, Oh, you weakling, you know, and you've got all your little, you've got, we've got all our little one-liners for all this stuff that we do it. You Ranger guys are great for it. You got yeah. better ones than I do, right? You got all your one-liners and, and you run that through your head and then you go talk to your boss and you go, isn't, isn't this, isn't this ridiculous? All these people out here suck. Ha ha ha. And you hit them on the elbow. And the next thing they say is come, come over, come to HR because we need to have a talk with you. And it gets obtuse and you start feeling lonely. You don't have a battle buddy. You don't have somebody that, that uh, kind of sees it the way you do. Um, you don't have any of that. So your speed limit when you walk out can't be set at the speed limit that you were doing the day you walked out. You need to take a deep breath. Um, if you have terminal leave, take every ounce of it. Do not start working or anything else. And I would tell you, I, I tell you, don't be scared to start a relationship with a counselor because yeah. not your first counselor may not be the counselor. You may have to go through a few, mm -hmm. but go, go somebody professionally to sit down and say, okay, I'm a new military vet. My, my therapist, I told her I was going to charge her, do reverse charges on her <laughs> because she has so many military guys. Her and I, our relationships gotten really strong and she knows that I was at a senior position. I, I had Napoleonic charts drawn all over her office explaining to her how the chain of command works and how you how you report through it and how you work through it and all that stuff. Because she needed to understand that because the majority of the guys that are still on active duty that she's working with have these issues and she was just needed a visual. Yeah. So so you need to slow down. You got you have to take the time that's allotted to you, take every minute of it and start to put people into your life. So here, here it's not in, it's not natural, right? Right. It's not natural. It's not, it's, you know, you only go see the first sergeant for things, right? right. You've got to go through the first sergeant. You, but other than that, don't bother the first sergeant. Well, this is a whole reverse thing. Um, now, when you talk about leadership, now it's self-leadership and it's self-talk. And if you're a true leader, which we all are, if we've served, it doesn't matter what level you got out or if you did four years or 44, um, we're all leaders. So lead yourself with the tools that you have. But you have to invert them. Yeah. So you serve yourself. Serve yourself. Get yeah. yourself right before you try to jump into a new culture because it is a new culture. Use a new language because it is a new language. Because quite frankly, if you roll in, and some of these mistakes I made, if you roll in and you go, I know how to do this and just do this and this and this and this and this and this and this, what ends up happening? Somebody goes, we aren't into that military stuff. Yeah. And it's not that it wouldn't work. It's that they don't understand that they have their own fear and pain and they're actually scared to death of you. And they think that they actually think that if they drop a book really loud on the table, that you're going to punch them. Yeah. And that's not the case. Odds are you're going to roll up into a ball or something, yeah. you know, the exact opposite, or you're going to have to take a time out. Yeah. So, so uh, build those relationships and, 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 and let people know um, where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and they're here. Now we're into transparency, right? Yeah. And you got to be transparent with yourself and then and, and and let people know who you are and where you're coming from and what you think's weird and and try and learn a little bit. So you got to slow yourself down. Yeah. I don't know. Where do you where, where do you fall on? I, that? So I agree 100 percent on everything you said. And I'm, I'm just going to double down to people that are listening on the take the time. If you have the terminal leave, use the terminal leave for yourself, because we all know the, the we all know the guys and gals that are like, I'm going to get I'm going to double dip. For this 90 days, it's 120 days and make as much money as I can. And I'm going to, I'm this treadmill's at, you know, a 10 incline and going on a 10 and I'm going to just, uh, I'm just going to keep going. Right. And they, they burn out because they never reset and got a 10,000 foot view of, of their new life. And, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's just, you got to stop, right. And get a new perspective and, uh, um, Re, re readjust reorganize just like you do in combat and and get ready for the next one because it is it is definitely different on the outside and i think the longer you spend in the military the more different the outside is really going to be and you and we can me and you dave we can say this till we're blue in the face but because we're all stubborn we're not going to believe it until we actually get out there and see it for ourselves and then they'll call back to us or send us a text and go 
You are so right. It is just, it is, I didn't think it was going to be like this. I thought that was going to be just your experience. So, uh, and you segue perfectly there. So the first time we met you, you were open right away. You said, I just got back from seeing my, my therapist and, um, uh, uh, I, you know, I found the power of therapy and like you, I shopped around for a while before I found somebody that I paired with. I didn't just, I didn't just walk away when I didn't get along or didn't see eye to eye with the first one. I, I stayed committed and found somebody that really helped me out. Uh, you're a very intelligent person. Like you said, sometimes you think you could charge the therapist when, and you know, I have felt that before when speaking to them, uh, cause they just don't understand, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've been through and things we've done. Um, but what, what does therapy do for you? Why, why is it important? Why do you recommend it to, to guys and gals, especially that are, you know, out of service? So the tactical level therapy, the number one at the absolute tip top was this whole concept about boundaries and playing within what you can control. Because we're all superhuman, right? We're raised and trained to be superhuman. So we take it all on. Right. We watch CNN and we want to go to Ukraine and, and, and fix that problem. Right. Yeah. We're not going to do that right here. I get, it. I get it, man. But you lose sleep over it. Right. Yes. And so you bleed off energy. We have we have a finite amount of energy. And the older we get, especially with our backgrounds, the older we get, it's harder to keep that energy up. And, and our capacity, you know, it's 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 supply chain. It's logistics. Right. It's volume, volume, uh, velocity and and. Uh, and and how all of that moves and so we our our pipe gets smaller as we get older and then we have these stressors on us that that make our that make our um our pipe smaller so so yeah as you uh as you um transition into a relationship with a therapist mine she's my my therapist's armenian she comes from war-torn armenia and so she's got some pretty this is why our relationship is kind of where it's at and and uh, yeah, as soon as she started drawing little pictures on the board, I said, okay, well, here's what you can control, here's what you can't control, and and you need to, you know, you need to use your energy in here and and affect the things you can control, which is all your gut, all your junk, right? And stop playing out here and this other stuff. Um, boy, that that was absolutely huge. That was that was number one. The second thing is is that uh, once you and you said you shopped around. Once you get comfortable enough uh, to share that type of stuff, you actually kind of get a battle buddy out of it. Yeah, right. And it, Absolutely. And that, and that is, I think, that is huge because you actually have that person. Yeah. It's the, you know, and, and they make your foxhole better, don't they? Every day, every time I leave there, my foxholes are in better shape. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. It's uh, I, I've been out of therapy for a little bit and I'm looking to get back into it here soon. Uh, just like everybody, I got out of the military and thought I could do it on my own and realized that's not the that's not the right answer. Uh, but uh, it's it's super. I think, you know, for us, senior senior people always looked for us to us for the answer. Right. Uh, to make the call, make the decision. And uh, it was hard for me to open up and have somebody else help me make decisions on me. Right. And, and help me understand me and grow my own emotional intelligence. And it, just, it, it took me a while to open up to my therapist. I had to come out, you know, clean with her probably 60 to 90 days in and say, I've been lying to you for the last however long. I haven't been fully honest. But today, you know, we built this relationship. I'm going to I'm going to lay all my cards on the table. And boy, did talk about a rucksack feeling like you take it off. When I left that session, it was it was unbelievable. Um, a couple other things we talked about when we first spoke is uh, moral injury and, and pain and fear. And you just had some great takes on that. And I'd, I'd like you to share with the listeners. Yeah, well, you know, the two things that absolutely keep us from being who we want to be and where we want to go are pain and fear. And uh, so you and I both are farm kids and we hunt. So this analogy may not work for everybody, but but the majority of your audience will get it. If you've got a spot on your wall where you want to put those that that set of elk horns, you want to put you know it, and and you're out there working because elk horns work. Yes, and you're and and you're standing you're standing at the edge of a 700 foot ravine and 250 yards across there out steps the elk, and it's two hours before sundown, and it's about seven degrees below zero, and you look at your buddy and you say, there's my elk. 
And your buddy says, it's going to fall into the ravine. It's going to be dark in two hours. It's going to take us two days to get it out, get it out of here. We're going to have to call in favors for three people that own horses. And, uh, um, and I'm cold and I'm hungry. And you don't shoot it. Because you threw up all of these reasons why you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Versus take the shot and do the work and then fight through the and fight through the fear and the pain. So hold the moral injury thing to the side. So when we start this journey out into the civilian world, when we get when we get far enough away, the closer you are, the less the PTSD is, right? Because the closer you because it's just cycles and it just gets right on top of itself. And as you back out, even you go back to the fob, it gets a little worse. You go back to the world, it gets a little worse, right? You get out of the you get out of the military, it gets it gets a little worse because you have these gaps in there and because you're not you're not cycling the same way. And because you're you're losing those things, whatever that is, um, that drives fear and pain, right? You're scared of where you're at. You're scared of where you're thinking. You're scared of your, yourself. You get kind of scared of yourself, and 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 you can actually scare people around you. So that's energy. It's negative energy, and that has a polarity on it. Well, the only way to shoot the elk is to change the polarity on the energy, and say, I can't wait to call Bob. Because I know he's going to want to come down here with the horses. And I know two guys that are quick butchers. And I don't think it's going to take us two days. I think it's going to take us. We're going to, we're going to knock that thing down, make sure the bears don't eat it tonight. We'll be back here tomorrow morning. I bet by tomorrow night, we're actually talking about how we're going to get it up on the wall when it's fully taxed. Right. That's two to two same exact things. Look at the energy. Yeah. Even, even you are not, you are ready to go kill the elk. Right? Yeah, that's right. So, so there's just two. So how do you take that on? Well, I, it's it's self talk. It's it's what 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 we tell ourselves we believe, and we got to start doing this right. And that's uh, and that comes with even the, the relationships we talked about. Yeah, moral injury. So here's everybody's, and, and I've had so many people write me back. It's people that worked for me or were under my you know my leadership at a certain point in time that always appreciate this. Human, you don't have to have been in the foxhole and lost your buddy right next to you in some violent event. To have PTSD. Right. There's a lot of things um, that the military does because they have to, because of the profession we're in and, and what we have to execute that requires us to be tied to things. And it requires a relationship. It's like a marriage um, on steroids. Yep. And it requires a relationship. And when that relationship ends, it ends violently. And in fact, the person that divorces us is so narcissistic, they don't even have feelings. Because they're so big. You know, it's the bucket of water thing. You stick your thumb in the bucket of water, right? When you yank it out, there's a little ripple. And five minutes later, anybody that comes by would never know that there was a thumb in the water. Ever. Ever. That's kind of like getting out of the military. Yeah. And so in there, there's a lot of moral injury. I mean, you're you're invested at a level and, and the, the back-end satisfaction isn't there. And so um, you can be injured morally in, in, a, in a lot of ways. And that's a real thing. And quite frankly, I don't know how you feel about it, but my moral injuries, and I and I have a few set examples on some things that are, were not fun. My moral injuries for a long time embarrassed me. And they yeah. embarrassed me so much that it's like it's like that deep dark. I mean, there's you know, it's the Jahari's window thing. There's things that you know that nobody else knows. And you know, people say things like, I'll die with that secret, nobody else will ever know, and those kind of things. And so that may be the hardest thing to overcome is to say, this is how I'm feeling based on this, whatever it is, to get that out there. Because, it, it you know, the, um, the human reaction to that is embarrassment and to close down. And quite frankly, that might be the heaviest rock. You know, when you talk about the scales, that might be the heaviest rock. Yeah. And if you can take that rock off, man, everything gets a lot easier. Yeah. So when you you talk about PTSD, I mean that's a dirty acronym, right? For us A type guys, uh, I think we have all probably gone through the phases of uh, it's not real, it's not a real thing. I don't believe in it. Anybody who has says they have it is is lying. I know I did that early in my career, and I think it was a way to compartmentalize and keep pushing forward and keep rolling in and out of combat zones. Right. Uh, but eventually, it's going to show itself, right? And uh, unfortunately, the Ranger community just lost. You know, somebody who's kind of a hero that we, you know, one of those that you go, I never thought that would happen. I never thought he would take his own life. Um, 
what are some tools and resources that you know that you could maybe share to to get at that PTSD problem? Well, we own it, buddy. It's us. Yes. Right? It's 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 a poked out eye, right? It's an injury. If your eye gets poked out, guess what? You're a one-eyed guy. That's right. <laughs> when I talk, I use this example. If you and I are driving down the street and two cars in front of us, the guy hits a guy on a bike, knocks him completely off his bike, sends him flying across the road. You're going to get out. I'm going to get out. And we're going to do some stuff. I'm going to, you know, you're calling 911 and I'm going to go do an initial assessment on this guy and see if he's okay. Right? Guy, gal, or whatever. And we're going to do the best we can with the knowledge that we have and the, and the, and the tools that we have in place. And then some higher level of care is going to come and it's going to, it's going to go. When somebody has a mental health bike wreck, people turn around, go seven blocks around the whole thing and, and, and don't tell anybody they ever saw it. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so the tools on PTSD are one is, you got to have these relationships and you got to know that you have it. Yeah. Two is for your ranger buddy. Two is you've got to be able, this is the 25 yards, man. We have got to start closing the 25 yards on ourselves. Yeah. I was sitting with a bunch of folks and they're, they want to do some mental health work with a, with a certain um, societal group. I'm not going to get into too many details. It's not military, similar, but not military. They brought me in to ask me subject matter expertise. And they have the ad campaign. They want to set up the traditional conference. They want to bring people in. They want to have the discussions and the keynote speakers and all go around it. And I said, I said, well, I said, we're going to have to work really hard on building communications that leave open relationships of trust and build trust. And they threw me out of the room, you know, because they thought I was goofy. Hmm. And so I've kind of stepped back from that. Because you know as well as I do that that's the whole thing. So I think that you have to have people in your life that have similar experiences to help you walk that trust forward, the relationships with your, your counselors and your wife and your family and all the things that go along with that. And we have to be very open. So I don't want to get into vulnerability like it's like, you know, I don't want people to think of vulnerability where it's uh, 1970s uh, hate Ashbury, everybody sitting around talking about love and children and those kind of things. Because, because you know, we just went through it to pull. If you look at the millennials now, the geriatric millennials, that first generation of millennials, when I was leading them, it used to freak me out. I had to change my whole way of looking at things because I would ask an airman, I'd say, how are you doing today? And he'd go. Oh, I just got back from the clinic and I had to get treated because I got a venereal disease because I was with this girl. And they start and you're like, whoa, yes, I don't know if I was ready. for that. But in some ways, there's magic to that. You know, man, I think with PTSD, you almost have to go into every environment with some sort of disclosure. You know, if you get admitted to the hospital because you, you broke your leg and you have PTSD, tell the staff. Tell the staff when they're coming in because they're going to take care of you like you got a broken leg. And they're going to do things that 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 uh, make you feel unsafe, and they're going to put your room in a certain configuration. They teach nurses this all the time about about dealing with this. So I don't know if I'm scratching your itch here because it's really hard. But I, yes, if if we don't, if we, you've got to say it out loud. You got to own it. You got to understand it's part of you, and you have to say it out loud. And when you say it out loud, everything starts to change. And your relationships start to change and your scales balance easier and there's less weight on them. And, and so you have to say it out loud. It's just like, it's just like, you know, cancer patients saying, you know, I got diagnosed with cancer and everybody goes, Ooh, the C word, you know, cause it makes you, cause people internalize things. Right. And when you say it out loud, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to make people uncomfortable and you need to make people comfortable around you so that they understand. Yeah. Cause you know, you know, I, if you're like me, my triggers are such small things that people think they're irrelevant. Yeah. It's not big. Well, 4th of July sucks, but it's not, you know, as far as sounds and noises and helicopters drive me absolutely crazy. That's ty that type of stuff is, is a thing, but it's the little things. It's I'll give you an example. It just happened to me. It's just a trigger. I was so embarrassed when it was over with, but I went and talked to somebody. I'm on the phone 
with a bank and I need this lady to help me. And she's got to move some numbers around to get my problem solved. And she wasn't equipped to solve it. But instead of trying to give me options and help, she started to disengage on me. And you know, I snapped because I didn't feel safe. I had built a relationship with this person and they were abandoning me. Yeah. And as soon as I started to feel abandoned, I snapped. Yeah. She didn't know that. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't as hard on her as I would have been five years ago because I'm in a better place. <laughs> I was, I was not pleased and it took me a while to recover from that. Yeah. You got to say it out loud. I mean, we have to, it, it's us. Just yeah. be, yeah. I Does think, help? yeah, I think you said it, you said it perfect. It, it's us and we got to own it, right? It's us. We got to own it. And it's hard. It is hard to do uh, because anytime we've owned up to an, in, an injury, you know, physical in the military, you get taken out of position or, or, or they're looking at who's going to replace you. Should it be long-term? Um, so it's just, it's ingrained in us not to own up to a lot of stuff and, and lie to ourselves and not own it. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I posted a post on LinkedIn yesterday. First time I've ever said it out loud. You know, I have PTSD and, uh, I probably look, wrote that post and I looked at that post button for 45 minutes before I hit it because I was so scared to do it. Right. But I felt better afterward and the feedback and the people who came to me and said, you know, I got you, brother, you know, thanks for doing that. It just makes it better, but it's hard. And I just hope, hope more of our brothers and sisters can, can own it because it does, it really does start with you. It's got to start with you. you got to initiate movement on your own and then hopefully people will rally around you. Um, but uh, it's, uh, but there's another thing you said, I think that probably has a impact and I know it impacts especially the ranger communities you quit drinking a few years ago how does that how did that affect your your life as a whole the ptsd the transition everything three best counselors in life man the most reliable most accessible 24 7 counselors are jim johnny and jack yeah um i probably started my journey without i mean i was always drinking because of the way i was raised i'm a i'm a portuguese i'm fourth generation portuguese immigrant big latin family you know big uh, you know iberian peninsula type family and wine was always at the table and and uh, just part of life so that was always kind of there um but uh you know more responsibility more exposure more traumas more things and 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 it's just easier to just crawl in that bottle um it betrays you it betrays you every morning but you know if you work your if you work your yeah uh, you know if you work your schedule the right way you, you know you reintroduce it and it keeps you it keeps you comfy and and uh, what it does do, though, is it, it creates a it creates a fog in our lives that um, we we normalize to. And uh, so, you know, I was uh, I was I was that guy, and uh, had a blood clot from my groin to my ankle. It all went in my lungs, and uh, you get a chance to sit and think, and where you're at, and what you need. And I said, well, I think. My scales are like this, and uh, I got to put something on this side that's not liquid and brown comes out of a bottle, and uh, and I quit. That's um, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna just just for just for a theatrical effect here. I'm gonna tell you exactly how many days because <laughs> I've got a I've just downloaded an app. I'm working with a guy. It's called Sober Sidekick, and uh, it's a wonderful thing, and and uh, it's a it's a virtual uh in time uh real life you can get on there and 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 work with your buddies and so i think it has an application for what we're doing too and, and we're looking at some of that stuff so um but uh uh oh we shouldn't have done this it's all right we're live it's all good <laughs> it's all good um so i have been sober for uh 1698 days oh wow so yeah and it's it's the best 1698 days that that I could imagine and I celebrate every Monday morning I call it sober Monday and and it's clarity right and we all want clarity in our in our lives and I think PTSD makes us unclear and so the alcohol gets us to a point where it uh, it calms that down that energy down and and kind of tampers it but uh boy for those of you that are out there, if you want to hear one thing that might make you quit drinking, um, you're really not that funny. <laughs> and you're really not the life of the party. Right. <laughs> and people are tolerating you. They're not like hanging out with you. Yeah. And, uh, and so and I had to change some friends, Yuma. Yeah. I had to 
yeah. some things have changed in my life. Well, with alcohol went went some other stuff, and and I write about that. There's a whole yeah. there's a whole piece in there. So everybody's got their relationship with alcohol, whatever yeah. it is. Most people drink. When you don't drink, you you really are in tune with the consumption that goes on around you, and so everybody has a relationship with alcohol. And and if you have a healthy one, and I always admire people when I walk into their house and they've got like a bottle of wine sitting there and it's got a cork in it. And it's like two thirds of the way full. <laughs> right. I think really you can drink just one glass of wine. I, <laughs> I don't even know what that's about. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. That's, that's funny. I, I understand that. And, uh, so as we kind of bring in the plane and, and land it here to use some air force uh, sure. terminology here, yeah. we, we brought it up when we started, we got to know a little yeah. bit about maximum fabulous. Yeah. Well, for your, for your listeners, and I know there's probably non-military listeners out there you, when you're leading, when you're leading, you've got to do a couple of things to take on pain and fear. And, and so I'm going to Iraq, 235 medics coming from all over the world. We've done it. You know, you, you just marry, you know, you're marrying up into, into whatever your, your BCT or whatever the heck you're doing in your army world. And, and you're marrying up and I'm thinking, how am I going to get these people to coalesce and get them through what's probably going to be the, some of the most significant points in time in their life? I mean, period. That's, that's just the way it is. And so I came up with two things um, and I'll do this quickly. I came up with two things. One was um, a daily attitude, an organizational attitude. And two was uh, sharing some pain. And the one thing I hate most in the world is push-ups. And so I was going to do push-ups. I was going to do push-ups to make me stronger. And I was going to do some push-ups with other people to make them stronger. But it's a, it's a, it's a five or 10 minute bonding point as I'm, as I'm, you know, making the rounds. And so uh, when I would come, when I would come in the trauma center, the first office, the way the office, there was an old hardened Iraqi building and the trauma center was built up next to it. And the first office on the hallway when I would come in was the chaplain's office. And it was a different chaplain every day, but it was 24 seven. So I'd get on my knees and get a prayer on my head. I'd let, literally have somebody put their hands on me and pray on me. And sometimes it was the rabbi and sometimes it was the Baptist minister. And so I was just, it was crazy. The words were always the same. The foundation was great. And then the next stop was with the admin people. And these are the people that, uh, for all of you out there, these are the people that pushed all the buttons that got all those wonderful airplanes to haul you back to your homes and be with your families in, in almost zero amount of time, you know, Germany and then home. And uh, they worked some magical stuff. So we did some push-ups. We started with five. You know, that's that's the Air Force way. Start with five. Yeah, the Army right. guys that worked for me, Army and the, the Army and Marine guys that worked for me, they wanted to do 50. And, and we would, those of us that could, but we would. And so we do five push-ups, but at the end of that, um, uh, the push-ups, the question's always, Chief, how are you doing? Now, that's an innocuous question, right? Or it's top, how are you doing? Or it's, it's sergeant, you know, how are you doing? What, whatever it is, it's an important answer. And I would always answer, I'm maximum fabulous. And people would say, what in the hell is that? And I said, that is the, that is the top rung on the hierarchy of attitude. And we're not going to have a day where we can always be at maximum fabulous, but that's the target point. We're going to get to that, and we're going to we're going to stay positive, and even 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 on our worst day, we're going to find the silver linings, and we're going to work towards being max fab. Yeah. So, long story short, I go to leave the, the obligatory downrange going away party where everybody's stuffed around one barbecue grill, and somebody's found something better to eat than what's in the in the deep vac, and and. Uh, um, I had gone back and forth with the boss about what I wanted. And, and I told him I wanted the American flag at a hero's highway, the flag that all of our sons and daughters crossed underneath just before they came into the trauma room to have us work our magic. And um, it's a big flag and they're all in the museums around the world. And I was never going to get one anyway, the congressman had them spoken for. But I told him I wanted the flag off the top of the trauma center, the Red Cross, Red Crescent flag, the Geneva Convention flag. And he told me, you're probably not going to get that either. There's not very many. But if you look behind me, um, you'll see the flag. And they embroidered my name and somebody took it down to some place and got it. I don't know what they did, but it took a little effort. But they embroidered my name, date, and times that I was there. And on the bottom of it, it says Maximum Fabulous. Yeah. And so um, that was the rallying cry, man. Yeah. You know, the 10th Mountain says to the top. At least for my time in Blod, the trauma center was maximum fabulous. So uh, there's all kinds of war, war cries, and that was our war cry. But it uh, it's it's worked even since I've been out. It's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, I love it, and it's uh, it's a simple thing that we've heard 
you know, probably from the time we were playing youth sports or something, attitude is really everything. It's really, it starts with attitude. Um, and, uh, to, to the last question I ask, I ask of everybody that comes on the podcast, if you go back and talk to airman, David, uh, what, uh, what advice would you give him? Um, understand friendship at a level of, the, of what it really is and cherish the one, cherish the true friends in your life. Hang on to your money um, and spend it a little bit later. And don't get so focused on your career and being high speed, which is my call sign, being high speed that you run over the top of the things that are really important. Yeah, I love it. Uh, David, thanks again for coming on here, sharing a little bit about it. Don't forget, he's got a book out there too. I, I meant to have a copy right here and show everybody. You have a copy right there. Yeah. Pick it up, read it. And I, I, it's got more of this. It's got David bleeds through the, through the words in there. And he, he you know, I, if there's people that you come across in your life that you say, man, I wish I could have worked for that guy. You are definitely one of them. And for all the listeners out there, do the, do everything I need you to do, like share, subscribe, and uh, we'll catch everybody out there on the next episode. Thanks again, David. Thank you, Yuma. Godspeed, brother. <laughs>